Hello and welcome to our part two video on introduction to psychology. Today our focus is going to be on the history of psychology and its perspective. So the origins of psychology date back to the classical and ancient world. We can go to Asia and look at writings by Confucius, or we can go to the Greeks and read about their ideas of consciousness with Plato and Aristotle. Now, both European and Asian and even African cultures had ideas about psychology. However, there has been a strong European influence on the field of psychology. Now, during the Middle Ages, Europeans thought that the mind and how it worked was not something that one could comprehend. But Rene Descartes proposed in the 17th century that sensations were a part of a nervous system. And with that, psychology was starting to look like a field to study. So psychology became an official science when Wilhelm Wundt conducted his first psychological experiment on December 25th, 1879, following the scientific method. Throughout his career, he focused on sensations, perceptions, and general feelings that are related to human behavior. When looking to understand the human consciousness, he used a process called introspection. And with that, it would describe your conscious experience in a systematic way. For example, you might be asked to look at a picture. Now, can you describe that picture? Well, that would then be describing what you're thinking at the time and getting in a little bit to the mind. However, there are some strengths and weaknesses of that. Now, psychology has different schools of thoughts known as perspectives, and Wilhelm Wundt created the first one known as structuralism. Structuralism is devoted to uncovering the basic structures that make up the mind and thought. It's looking for the elements of our conscious experience. Structuralism relies on introspection or the process of reporting one's own conscious mental experiences like we just did. Now, of course, there's going to be critics of that. As psychology grew as a science, other perspectives to st started to emerge. Some people began to dispute and refute structuralism. Their main issue was with introspection. American psychologist William James believed that psychology should look at the function and not just the structure. For him, he created functionalism. Functionalism is a theory that focuses on the functions of consciousness and the ways consciousness helps people adapt to their environment. James thought that psychology should explain how people adapt or did not adapt to their everyday life. And for that, you cannot find that in a laboratory setting, what Wilhelm Wundt was doing. An experiment done in any lab would not give a good explanation for a real world event. For example, if somebody is having a lot of stress at work, well, you cannot replicate 100% somebody's work environment and workload in a laboratory setting to really see how stress is impacting them and also what is provoking that stress. So with James functionalism, he wanted to see how people functioned in their everyday life. He also believed that the mental processes that we have are not constant and they're not fixed. He basically said that we have a stream of consciousness. And so with that, he just wanted to observe people kind of in their everyday life. So modern psychology is rooted in history, of course, and there's going to be these different perspectives coming out. Of course, we've now covered structuralism and functionalism, but there's going to be more gestalt, psychology, behaviorism, psychoanalysis, and even more. So we're going to be covering nine main perspectives here. Some people bring it down to seven, some to eight different levels, but we're going to be going over biological, developmental, cognitive, psychodynamic, behavioral, sociocultural, evolutionary trait perspective, and just kind of a few more here and there. You'll notice that. But let's start with that one that I already mentioned, Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology looked at psychology in a completely different way than structuralism. For Gestalt psychologists, they wanted to look at the small pieces of information and then try to make a meaningful whole. 
For example, you might have a favorite song, but that song is a collection of individual notes. And then if you have a favorite album, of course, that album is a collection of various songs. And so with Gestalt psychology, it looked at how the brain works by studying perception and perceptual thinking. For example, they show people's faces or parts of faces. If you have them all in the right location and then kind of have some parts missing, you're going to recognize still that it is a face. However, if you put the eyes randomly in one location, ears randomly in one location, um, and a mouth, you know, who knows where, uh, it might be a little bit difficult. It might take your brain a few seconds longer to recognize what exactly you are looking at because it can't just naturally fill the gaps. Now, another perspective is behaviorism, and this one is mainly advocated by John B. Watson, who focused solely on observable events. To him, he thought that psychologists could not really understand the mind completely. And so for him, he was looking at how do people respond to the stimuli in the environment? Because if we cannot fully understand the mind, well, then why are we spending so much time on it? It can be misleading. Let us look at what we can observe. However, quite quickly, uh, we have another person who is definitely looking at the mind and in it and coming up with his own perspective. We have Freudian psychology coming out with the perspective of psychoanalysis. Of course, it is founded by Sigmund Freud and his followers. Psychoanalysis focused on mental disorders and stated they resulted from conflicts of the unconscious mind. Freud thought that behavior came from unconscious experiences, drives, and conflicts. For example, forgotten memories could be impacting your present day life without you really noticing it or understanding it because it's all happening in the back of your brain, not in kind of the front. However, not all of his followers liked exactly everything that he was going for. And so from psychoanalysis, we're going to have another perspective, psychodynamic. Now, psychodynamic thinks of the mind or the psyche as kind of this reservoir of energy or these dynamics. Psychodynamic psychologists think we are driven by irrational desires generated in our unconscious mind. And these unknown thoughts impact our conscious thoughts throughout our day. They like to use an iceberg example where, yeah, we have the iceberg popping out of the water and that is our consciousness. That's us kind of in the daylight sun. However, there's a lot going on underneath the water and that is our unconscious and our pre-conscious mind. Of course, this is something we'll be going over in a later video. Now, another perspective is the biological view. The biological view looks at how our physical makeup and our brains impact our personality, our behavior patterns, our abilities, and even our preferences. Followers of the biological view um, look at our behavior as a result of heredity, the nervous system, and basically our environmental impacts that we have, for example, disease that may then influence us and our behaviors. Now with this, we have kind of a more minute focus coming in with evolutionary psychologists because they agree with the biological perspective, but they are focusing kind of on the theories of Charles Darwin. And like Charles Darwin, evolutionary psychologists see behavior mental processes in terms of their genetic adaptations for survival and reproduction. They look at natural selection to see how kind of this has impacted humans from generation to generation to generation. And with this, we have then another offshoot, evolutionary sociobiological. And with this perspective, yes, you are going to be looking at evolutionary psychology. We're going to be looking at natural selection. We're going to be looking, you know, even at DNA, at hereditary factors that might influence us. But we're also going to look at cultural factors because, yes, genetics can show certain things, but we shouldn't rule out culture. We have another perspective, and that is the behavioral view, not behaviorism, behavioral. This one looks to see how we kind of learn based off a system of rewards and punishments or by simply observing as a small child. A child watching another child learn how to walk for the first time might go, hey, I bet I can do it. So we put our kind of arms up a little bit, get some balance, and there we go. Now I'm toddling along. 
So with this viewpoint, it kind of is looking at the actions in the environment rather than the mental processes. And a major per, uh, person within this field is B.F. Skinner. And so, for example, he might ask the question, can you prove that you have a mind? Another perspective is known as the cognitive view. We are dictated by the way we process the events of our environment. Cognitions are thoughts, memories, expectations, the state of consciousness that we have, and our perceptions. They combine kind of the structuralist, functionalist, and gestalt perspectives all into one, focusing on thinking. Another viewpoint is the developmental view. The developmental view examines the changes that are occurring across our entire lifespan from prenatal development all the way through late adulthood. It also looks at that debate of nature and nurture. Which one had a stronger impact on you or on this specific decision? Was it nature? Was it nurture? Was it our environment or was it our genes coming into play here? Two major uh, people in the developmental view are Jean Piaget and Kohlberg. You can also throw Eric Erickson in there too, as well. So we have the humanistic uh, perspective as another one. So with humanistic psychology, they are going to be looking at healthy people and how they can kind of reach their full potential. How do you grow. For example, there is a psychologist, uh, Carl Rogers, in this field who looks at an oak tree and what are the items needed for that oak tree? Well, of course, if it's a tree outside, you're going to need some sunlight, some water, nutrients, things like that. Well, then you as a person, what do you need to grow to your full potential? Now, like the psychoanalytic perspective, it examples our mental thoughts and processes as the root of our behavior, but it focuses on the positive side. However, some psychologists have kind of critiqued humanistic psychology as not being scientific. Another perspective is the sociocultural view looking to see how thinking and behavior are impacted depending on the situation or the environment that we live in. This perspective examines the importance of social learning, social interactions, and cultural perspectives. Now, what is culture? Culture is a complex blend of beliefs, customs, values, and traditions developed by a group of people and shared with others in the same environment. Now, psychology has kind of been blinded a little bit to culture uh, for many years. Now, if you would look at psychology uh, 30 to 40 years ago, 90% of the major psychologists that were writing in the journal, our articles, and that were writing the books were mainly Caucasians from the United States and European universities, um, or graduates from uh, the United States or European universities. And so with this, they were not necessarily looking at culture because they all were kind of in the same cultural mindset. However, this has definitely been changing. And in another 30 years in the future, we'll see how much more culture is influencing um, the perspectives and the thinking within the field of psychology. So all of these different perspectives coming together has helped psychology. It's called the levels of analysis. Multiple viewpoints bring in a great understanding. For example, if I took a small child and asked them to explain a globe, but I only showed them a 2D picture of a globe, how well can they actually describe what a globe is? Well, they want to see a 3D object. Now, if we are looking at a issue within the realm of psychology and we only used one perspective to look at it, we're going to probably fail at getting the complete picture of what we're looking at. And so these various perspectives help psychology to be better by going and looking at it through different lenses. So when we look at psychology and these perspectives, just keep in mind that different psychologists are having different viewpoints as we go through this lecture series. And also note that psychology is changing and evolving itself as a science. So you're going to be hearing some theories and some perspectives along the way 
um, that are largely not necessarily followed anymore. Um, you're also going to be learning of some experiments that cannot be conducted anymore. So just keep your mind open and just note that changes do occur over time as we go through this lecture series. So for example, in recent years, biological, cognitive, and developmental perspectives have been gaining supporters while at the same time, behaviorism and psychoanalytics, uh, the Freudians have been losing followers. So it's just something to keep in mind as we go through here. Thank you for listening to the series on our introduction to psychology. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. And remember to like and subscribe to be able to know when I make another post. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.